Spirit of the living God, we come before you, Jesus, thanking you, Lord, uh, just for your grace and your mercy and that you uh, did find us just as we are. And in spite of who we are, you still love us, knowing the depths of our heart and uh, that your grace and your mercy continues to cover us. Lord, as we get into your word, um, Lord, we just ask that every distraction be removed and that uh, we can hear clearly from your spirit mm -hmm. for conviction, challenge, change, to be built up, comforted, and blessed. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. <clears throat> okay, so we're in Jude chapter, oh, not chapter, <laughs> verses 17 through 21. Um, this is entitled, Building Yourself Up. Okay, so we've been going through just the many parts of Jude dealing with um, apostates and apostasy and what they look like and how they basically creep in to the church to bring in destructive doctrines. In verse 16, he says, these are grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lusts. They mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. So they just, uh, they, they complain about God. They mumble under their breath. They butter up believers to get them to sway over to their direction. Verse 17 says, but you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. Okay, so in direct contrast to addressing uh, the nature and ways of the apostates and false teachers, Jude now turns to us, the beloved of God. Um, the beloved of God was not just those who were alive then in Jude's day, but also every believer in Christ from then till now and to those who will come to believe in the future. We are all the beloved. We are to remember the words of the apostles. Now, in Jews' time, uh, the apostles were traveling around. They were basically traveling pe preachers, and they were traveling around the known world, teaching and making disciples, planting churches, and they spoke with authority from heaven. Okay? So, when we think about what the, what the apostles spoke, when Jews says, remember how what was spoken before by the apostles, we don't have everything that the apostles spoke. In fact, we only have writings from a few of them. But what the Lord has given to us in the scriptures is all we need and is what he wanted for the church to live by for all time. See, all of the Lord's prophets and all of the Lord's apostles spoke and wrote way more things than we have in the Bible. But we have to understand not everything that they wrote or spoke was for all time. Most of it was for the particular time in which they live and to those particular people. For example, uh, Paul wrote three letters to the Corinthians, but the Lord only set apart two as scripture. In Acts, um, in Acts 20, 35, Luke is the author of Acts, and he recorded as scripture the words of Paul when Paul told the Ephesian elders this, and remember the words of our Lord Jesus Christ that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. That's in Acts 20, 35. Now, Jesus made that statement and he made it often, but check this out. The only place that we have it recorded in writing is in Acts with Paul quoting the Lord. You're not going to find that statement anywhere in the Gospels. But it's scripture because God put it in scripture. But when Jesus said it, it's not in the Gospels. Is that making sense? So Jude tells his readers who then actually lived during the time of the apostles to remember what they had taught them. 
um, concerning the apostates and the false teachers, that they would come into the church with their lying doctrines of demons. He said they're mockers of God. They're mockers of the word of God, and they're mockers of the people of God. Now, a mocker is someone who laughs at all things of God and rejects it. For example, um, where whatever the word of God declares to be the truth, the mockers reject it and declare something that's the complete opposite as the truth. For example, big thing in our modern times. In the beginning, God created humans, male and female. Today, the mockers say there are multiple genders. Now, as Christians, we try to live by the word of God, either doing the things that it says or not doing the things that it says we shouldn't do. And we live that way based on the word. However, where and when we fail, that's not mocking. That's failing. That's falling short because, as Jesus said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. In 2 Peter 2, 3, 2, 3 through 7, Peter wrote, Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget, or they are willfully ignorant. That by the word of God, the heavens and the earth were created, which are now preserved by the same word of God. And the present day heavens and earth are reserved for the day of judgment and fire that will come upon ungodly men. But the mockers will say, yeah, sure, God created everything. Everything's been the same for a hundred trillion billion years. And he ain't came back yet. Mockers laugh at us believers with disdain. And they boast about how they get what they want by not believing in God or by not following God. See, for the mockers, obeying the word of God is foolish. And that's because living for yourself has its rewards. I get what I want while not trying to deny myself and following God will get me nowhere. Look at you miserable Christians. You don't get to do anything, right? And honestly, as believers, sometimes you can feel like, man, look at them. They they get the, and they get away with it. (laughs) I don't really want to do that, but I want to do that. (laughs) <laughs> but I can't. <laughs> right, exactly. You know, or like, God, give me the strength to do good. Because if I want to do bad, man, I got all I got a cape. I got a big S on my chest. I can do some bad. But then it doesn't work out. And then here's this heathen that hates God and does the same thing and gets away with it. And then looks at me and laughs. In 2 Timothy 3, 2 Timothy 3, 3 on verses 1 through 5, Paul wrote this. But know this, in the last days, perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, that is destroying others' character, without self-control, brutal despiters, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying his power, and from such people turn away. I mean, I was just reading this right now, and I was just thinking about the people I see on YouTube. (laughs) Like, good gosh. (laughs) 
verse 19. These are sensual persons, persons who cause divisions, not having the spirit. Okay, so the, the, the mockers, the apostates, the false teachers, they do not have the Holy Spirit. They are simply of the flesh. It says they are sensual persons. Now, the word sensual means everything they do and desire is only on a natural level. The word translated as sensual is suke, or as we say, psyche. This is the same word for soul. It is, they are only on the level of the soul. It's the natural, psycholo psychological level of the unsaved. In psychology, uh, they tell you what you're doing, right? But they don't ever get to why you are doing it. It's because of somebody else. It's because you're a, a, an adult child of a such and such. No, it's sin. See, it's below the soul level. It's the spiritual. We don't sin. We don't become sinners because we sin. We sin because we are sinners. Right. You think about little kids. You never have to say, hey, why don't you stop sharing with your little brothers and sisters? Why are you so nice all the time? That's not what you got to teach them. Nope. It's the exact opposite because they're born little sinners. <laughs> Their word is mine. Mine. No. They are sensual persons, meaning they are body and soul. But we who are saved are body, soul, and spirit. See, the spirit of God is dwelling within us, but they do not have the Holy Spirit. They are an unsaved dichotomy. They're just body and soul. Now, when God created Adam, he created Adam in his own image and likeness, meaning he was without sin. He was able to conversate with God face to face in the cool of the day. He created Adam in a trinity, body, soul, and spirit. But when Adam sinned, the Holy Spirit departed from him and he began to die. After that, everybody born, everybody born since then was born body and soul and in need of salvation. By choosing to accept, accept God's gift of salvation, one is born again and the Holy Spirit then takes up residence within the believer, restoring us to our original complete state of being body, soul, and spirit. I hope that makes sense. So an unsafe person does not have the Holy Spirit. They have a soul and they have a body. But when we get born again, the Holy Spirit comes to indwell us. Proverbs 6 16 through 19 states this. These six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination, a proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift to running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among brethren. When apostates come into the church, they separate themselves from the word of God and they separate themselves from those who are walking according to the spirit of God. Yet because they are of the flesh and the, the flesh desires to lead people away from God. So they seek to draw believers, especially weak believers and new believers Away from the solid teaching of, word, of the word, they sow division in the church to get followers after themselves. In Acts 20, 
verse 29, Paul says, Savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing a flock. Also, from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. See, they'll often come in um, speaking and claiming that they have some new doctrine or some deeper secret un understanding of the scriptures that they want others to follow. It's like, I got this new teaching, this powerful teaching, right? But it's not unbelievers that they seek to convert to follow this message. It's believers they want to draw away to this great teaching. They'll often elevate these doctrines or, or their views to a level of salvation. In other words, if you don't accept this teaching, then you're not really saved. Um, if you ever meet any flat earth Christians, if you don't believe in a flat earth, then you're not saved. Or, or the old earth doctrine, I mean... The earth is billions and billions and billions of years old because, and there's a lot of different variations. The two basic ones are this, um, between Genesis 1 and 2, um, Genesis 1, 1 and Genesis 1, 2, it says, Genesis 1, 1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. Genesis 1, 2 says the earth was, out with, was without form and void. Well, they'll put time in between verses 1 and 2 and saying, this was when there was a war in heaven. The first earth got destroyed and God kicked the devil out. God had to remake the earth and put new people on it. Okay. The only problem with that is that means that death and sin had to happen before Adam. The other thing is, no, no, no. There's billions and billions of years. God just used evolution. So he made the suit that turned into a frog that gave birth to a chicken that had a man carrying a brief briefcase. <laughs> and if you don't believe that, you're not saved. There's denominations that are built upon false doctrines. Some state that every true believer speaks in tongues as the evidence of salvation. Yet the, the scripture clearly states in 1 Corinthians 12, 29, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, do all have the gift of healings, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret tongues? And the answer is no. Everybody is not gifted in all of those gifts. Speaking in tongues is not evidence of salvation. And no, the Spirit does not give a person the gift of tongues one time to prove that they are saved and then takes his gift back. <laughs> Romans 8, 14 states this. For as many are led by the Spirit, these are the sons of God, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So the Holy Spirit tells you if you are saved. Now, if you're a new believer, and a lot of believers that are still young in their faith, they do something wrong, and they wonder if they're saved. Well, unsaved people never worry about that. You're saved. The Spirit is speaking to you and just trying to grow you up. Acts 1.8, Jesus said this as proof of salvation, uh, one proof of salvation. He says, you will see, receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. In other words, Jesus said, as proof of your salvation, you're going to tell people about me, and it will be a powerful witness to them, speaking words that's going to affect them that you didn't even think of yourself. And, you, and you'll do it boldly. You'll do it at home. You'll do it in the next city, the next state, and anywhere in the world. You're going to share Jesus. That's proof of your salvation, right? When you get cornered, I mean, you may be a quiet, shy person. 
But when you're pressed on it, it's Jesus. But that's him that gives us the witness. Some teach you can only be saved if you're baptized. Others take it further and say you have to be baptized in Jesus' name. I've had people say, well, I, I, I got baptized, but somebody told me they didn't say in Jesus' name. Okay. Others take it even further still and say you're only saved if you're baptized in our church. And I guess if you change churches, you're no longer saved. But all of that is just simply human mind tricks to put the works of the flesh above the work of the Holy Spirit. This is what the apostates come with, these divisions. You know, when they baptized you, did they say in the name of Jesus? Well, it didn't really count. That has nothing to do with salvation. You get baptized because you are saved, not to get saved, right? One way of looking at it is like this. Did Noah build the boat because it started raining? Or did he build the boat because he believed it was going to rain? So you get baptized because of what you believe, not to become a believer. Colossians 2.8 states this. Beware, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the traditions of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. So when we think about things like psychology, it only goes according to the basic principles of the world. It doesn't reach the spirit because there is no spirit in them. It's just the cleverness of the human mind. And the thing about the soul, because we're chameleons, right? I mean, just be honest, we're chameleons, right? Everybody knows how to act in public. But you know what you do at home when nobody's there, right? Especially if nobody's in the house. You know what you do. Walk around talking to yourself, singing, making noise, right? But then you, right? Because we're chameleons, but the soul can mimic the spirit. We can act right. We can act like a believer and trick ourselves into thinking we're a believer. but it's only in the flesh. We can modify behaviors, but not address the issue. You know, um, if, if you ever been in like programs like AA or CA and stuff like that, they address the behavior, but not why. They'll call, oh, well, your drug addiction is a sickness. You're, 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 you're drinking. It's, it's a disease. Okay. How many diseases do you need an ID to purchase? <laughs> it's not a disease. It's a choice. And it's a choice to sin. Yes, it has effects, but it's still a choice. And it's sin. It, it, why do people go to jail for a disease? All the times I got arrested for a pocket full of diseases. That didn't make any sense. <laughs> That's on the level of the soul, but it's not the level of the spirit. But remember, there's no difference between the flesh of an unbeliever and the flesh of a believer. The only difference is this. As believers, we have two natures. We have our old nature of the flesh and our new nature of the spirit within us. And these two are at war with one another. The flesh wants to be glorified and draw everyone and everything after himself. The flesh wants to be the greatest villain, the biggest victim, and the greatest hero. It's all about me. Right? But all the glory goes to the Lord alone. And, and in your walk as a Christian, you may have come to that point where you struggle with 
all the glory is God's, right? I, I don't get a pat on the back for doing what God says. In the world, you get a pat on the back, right? Well, how come nobody recognizes me in God? Because it's all about him. Amen. Amen. Flesh is flesh, and we have these two natures. An old friend of mine says, the flesh is a worthy opponent. Because the minute you take your foot off his neck, man, he's back up swinging. You're like, didn't we just go through this? So because of that, there are also many believers in the church operating in the flesh, and they sow the same division in the church just like unbelievers will. Like unbelievers, they don't go after unbelievers. They come after weak believers who are not grounded in the word or mature in the spirit. Ephesians 4.14 tells us this. We should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men in a cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love that we may grow up in all things in him who is Christ Jesus the head. Those earthly, central, demonic doctrines teach everything that the world teaches. But when believers do it, they do it in the name of Jesus. Think about it. I'm sure you guys seen the alphabet uh, community pastors and teachers. Like, I mean, it's, I just this dude, he's a pastor with a full beard, wearing high heels and a skirt. We're talking about the Lord is love. No. I don't even know what Bible you're reading. But they'll say things like, well, the Bible's an ancient book and nobody can understand it. Okay. It was written by men. Uh, everything you read was written by men. It's the author that matters. So next time somebody tells you, well, the Bible was written by men, ask them this. Please name one thing that hasn't been. For real. And that would get them stumped. You live your life by something that you read, right? That was written by a man, too. Well, the Bible doesn't mean what it says it means. Does that stop sign mean stop? <laughs> the apostates are the believers walking in apostasy will call some special doctrine only for higher level Christians who can understand. And you can become a higher level Christian if you follow this teaching. But they are also the very ones who are offended by believers who stand upon the word and walk in the unity of the spirit. So they have to separate themselves and they cause divisions not having the spirit or at least not yielding to the spirit. James 3.14 states this. If you have bitter envy, and self-seeking in your hearts. Don't boast and lie against the truth. Don't say what you are doing is true and right and in God's name. Because things that are bitter, envy, and self-seeking, this wisdom to get what you want does not descend from above. It's earthly, sensual, and the word is psyche, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. Verse 20 says, But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Okay, so building yourselves up on your most holy faith does not mean that we have a special personal faith. There's only one faith. 
Nobody has a special path to salvation. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Back in verse 3, Jude began his letter stating, Contend earnestly for the faith which was once delivered for all to the saints. So building yourselves up on your most holy faith means properly studying the word, correctly applying it to the way we think, speak, and live. See, if you read the word of God and it tells you do this and you apply it to your life, you build yourself up in your faith. It's obedience that builds our faith. We want to say, Lord, give me faith. I'm going to go to sleep and it's going to happen. All right, but really what we're asking is, God, give me the magical power to make things come out the way I want. But that's not walking in faith. Walking in faith is hard. It hurts. I don't want to do it. But when we take a step in faith, the next step, we can look backwards and say, he did it before. He'll do it again. So building yourself up in your faith comes through obedience, comes through studying the word and applying it to our lives. Second Timothy 2.15 states, be diligent, our study, spudazo, to present yourselves approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We rightly divide the word of truth in the way we study, in the way we speak, in the way we live. It's rightly divided. When it comes to being a believer, we are to always remain a student of the word, but also be a teacher of the word. And how do we teach? We teach in the way we live. We teach in the way we speak. We, it doesn't mean you have to be a teacher like you know, like me, like I'm doing, but everything we do, we have students, but we also are to remain a student. It's the word that sets us apart from the world. False doctrines and self-deception because the word is truth. So the word separates us from everything that is not of the word. The word is truth. Therefore, the word sanctifies us. If we apply our walk to the word, it's truth. Acts 2.42 gives us a picture of four things that the church did in building themselves up in the faith. In Acts 2.42, it says, They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. They continue steadfastly in fellowship. They continue steadfastly in the breaking of bread. And they continue steadfastly in prayer. Study, fellowship, breaking bread, and prayer. Building ourselves up in our holy faith. So it says, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the spirit. Okay, so I want to make this perfectly clear. Praying in the Spirit does not mean only if you are praying in tongues. The scriptures have already told us that not everyone has the gift of tongues. As a matter of fact, the gift of tongues is a very minor gift. Praying in the Holy Spirit means to be praying according to the will of God. Sometimes we are in disagreement with the Lord, are struggling with something that is requiring us, requiring us to surrender to the will of God. Well, wrestling that out with the Lord is praying in the spirit. You may not agree with God, but you're fighting with God because you know God is right. Right. And and. Uh, Isaiah 118, the Lord says, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. In other words, the Lord is saying, come to me honestly. 
Let's argue this out. And then after I have set you straight, you ask for forgiveness and repent, then I'll clean you up and send you on the way that I told you to go in the first place. God says, you got a problem? Come on, let's argue it out. It's not like I don't know anyway. I just need you to hear yourself say it so you can be like, that sounds really dumb, Lord. <laughs> but that is praying in the spirit. Because he says, come now, come, let's reason, let's argue, let's fight. The problem is your arms are too short. You'll never connect. Praying in the Holy Spirit means praying the word of God and praying in agreement with the word of God. Sometimes praying in the spirit means just crying out when you're at a loss for words, but allowing the spirit to speak to our hearts for his peace and revelation. In Romans 8.26, it says the spirit also helps in our weakness, for we do not know what we should pray as we ought, but the spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. Sometimes all you can say is, ah! But God knows what that means, right? Praying in the Spirit also means praying in tongues, if you have the gift of tongues. Of course, in church gatherings, there's order. But when you're alone, exercise the gift. In Matthew 6, 6, Jesus said, when you pray, go into your room. And when you have shut the door, pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. People who do not speak in tongues are edified in prayer. They're edified in spirit. They're edified according to the gifts that God has given them. Tongues is just one way God has given a gift for edifying of self. But in tongues, unless you have the gift of interpretation, you don't know what you're saying. However, in the spirit, deep is calling to deep. And it's in that you find your peace, your rest, and your hope. In 1 Corinthians 14, 14, Paul said, for I, if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. He's like, yeah, I pray in tongues. I have no idea what I'm saying. My brain is arguing with me like you're just making noise. Why are you doing that? That's stop. <laughs> just don't do that. For real. But my understanding is unfruitful. What is the conclusion? I will pray with the spirit and I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the spirit. And I will also sing with understanding. So Paul says, yeah, when I'm by myself, I let loose in tongues. I don't know what I'm saying, but then I'll pray with my understanding. If you don't speak in tongues, that's fine. You still can pray in the spirit. Verse 21, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking out, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Okay, so we'll, we'll look deeper um, into keeping ourselves in the love of God next week. But as Harry Ironside, a commentator said, this does not do things so that God keeps loving you. That's not what it means. It doesn't mean do this so God keeps loving you. He cannot love you or me any less than he does, and he cannot love us any more than he already does. He loved us so much that he gave his life for us. There's nothing more he can add to that. But the Lord does continue to love us more and more as we walk through life. Now, by more and more, I mean continuously, every second of every day without diminishing in its potency. He loves us continually. So he loves us more and more, but he doesn't love us more. He just loves to continue to pour out an unending 
un everlasting love from him to us. Jude says to us who love the Lord, because he first loved us, remember the words of the scriptures spoken by the apostles. Be doctrinally and spiritually mature, and you will not be led astray. But embrace true doctrine, and you won't be misled by every intriguing doctrine. Unlike immature believers, feeding only upon the milk of the word, or like babies who put anything in their mouths to feed, we are to grow in maturity, feeding upon the solid food of the scriptures, being able to speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. So when it comes to the word of God, when it comes to fellowship, when it comes to prayer, keep building yourselves up. Amen. Amen. Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for your word tonight. Um, we praise you. We glorify you. We magnify you. And uh, if anyone is listening to the this message and you want to know the Lord Jesus Christ and you, you want to be saved, just uh, say this prayer. Lord Jesus, I believe you are God in the flesh. I confess that I am a sinner and I believe you died for my sins on the cross. I believe you rose again three days later. I thank you for receiving me as your child. I thank you for forgiving me as my, for my sins. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much that you never leave us, you never forsake us, and your love continues without fail, and that you give us your word to keep us grounded, to keep us led by the Spirit, and to keep us confident in knowing that we are saved and belong to you. We praise you and we glorify you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen. and amen.